there anything about either spacecraft that you found you liked more about the other that stood out as a feature, especially in terms of crew amenities? More Velcro on SpaceX, <laughs> on Greg. That's a crew amenity. That's a crew amenity. Which would We've be talked nice. about that. Yeah. That's why I said it. Yeah. A sleeker design with fewer buttons and totally automatic operation are the notable features that NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams highlights after returning to Earth aboard SpaceX Crew Dragon. Dragon isn't just advanced, it's reliable. With its proven safety record, it was the spacecraft that NASA trusted to rescue the stranded astronauts due to Boeing Starliner's thruster failures and helium leaks. And yet, Wilmore and Williams still prefer Starliner and say they'd rather fly on it again. Wait, what? That's like barely surviving a near-fatal car accident, only to turn around and say, yeah, I'd totally drive that same car again. So why are they so committed to Starliner? Find out everything in today's Tech Map episode. Despite the thruster failures and unexpected mission extension during their recent trip, NASA astronauts Suni Williams and Butch Wilmore say they'd fly Starliner again. Uh, I have a question for uh, both you, Sunny, and uh, Butch. Uh, given the opportunity, would you guys uh, go up on Starliner again? Yes. Because we're going to rectify all the issues that we, that we encountered. Yeah. We're going to fix them. We're going to make it work. This is what they said in the March 31st press conference. So what motivated them to ride on CST-100 again? Boeing's completely committed, NASA is completely committed, and with that I get on in heartbeat. They have then given many compliments on this vehicle. It is a great spacecraft and it has a lot of capability that other spacecraft don't have, and to see that thing successful and to be part of that program is an honor. Wilmore also cited that characteristic of Starliner, the ability of astronauts to take control of the capsule at any moment as opposed to Crew Dragon's more straightforward, idiot-proof autonomous flight. Um, there's no spacecraft that has all of this capability. I mean, I jokingly said a couple of times before we launched that I could literally do a barrel roll over the top of the space station. I would never do that, but uh, you can in this spacecraft. It is very, very capable. Or in the exclusive interview with Ars Technical, Williams told about the perfect launch aboard Starliner last summer. Oh man, the launch was awesome. Both of us looked at each other like, wow, this is going just perfectly. So the ride to space and the orbit insertion burn, all perfect. Their turbulent mission has also given Williams and Wilmore a unique perspective. They are the only astronauts to have flown in both Starliner and Crew Dragon, the two commercial spacecraft contracted by NASA to ferry people to and from the ISS. Of Dragon, SUNY praises it as a comfortable spacecraft. Dragon is a very comfortable spacecraft that tells you what it's doing, which is very nice versus having to interpret displays as we have done throughout the space programs with, uh, you know, former programs including um, shuttles. In addition, the pair was attracted to the amenities of the Crew Dragon. Was there anything about either spacecraft that you found you liked more about the other that stood out as a feature, especially in terms of crew amenities? on SpaceX, <laughs> on Greg. A sleeker design with fewer buttons apparently leaves plenty of surface area inside Crew Dragon for strips of Velcro astronauts can use to secure things like pens or notebooks from floating away. SpaceX's Crew Dragon isn't just another spacecraft. It's a revolution in spaceflight technology. Designed from the ground up for the 21st century, it merges cutting-edge automation sleek design, and intuitive controls, redefining how astronauts interact with their vehicle. As SpaceX engineer John Fetterspiel put it, the goal was to create a vehicle that truly felt like a 21st century spaceship. Spaceflight has come a long way from the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo eras, where astronauts relied on hundreds of switches, dials, indicator lights, and analog gauges a cockpit that felt more like an aircraft than a spacecraft. Back then, 
pilots used mechanical keyboards and joystick-like control sticks to operate their ships manually. Crew Dragon changes everything. Instead of a sea of physical buttons, astronauts interact with just three large touchscreens that control nearly every aspect of the spacecraft. These high-resolution displays allow them to navigate through multiple system panels, monitoring guidance, environmental controls, electrical systems, and more, all with a few taps. The ultimate goal of Crew Dragon's design? To make flying a spacecraft as seamless as possible. As Doug Hurley, commander of SpaceX's first crewed mission in May 2020, explained, you have an overall systems page on the screen, and then you can drill down into individual pages as well. There's a total of 25 to 30 individual pages, and SpaceX may have added some more since my flight. With any aircraft or spacecraft, you always iterate because it makes sense and it's easy and will help the crew. Ideally, astronauts won't have to touch the controls at all. Crew Dragon is designed to operate entirely autonomously, handling launch, orbit, docking, and re-entry without human intervention. But what if something goes wrong? Before the crew takes over, mission control serves as the first line of defense. SpaceX's ground team can troubleshoot issues and send remote commands in real time, acting as a safety net before the astronauts ever need to step in. And the final backup, manual control. Only in the rare event that both automation and ground control fail would the astronauts manually fly the spacecraft. A dramatic departure from earlier spacecraft, where pilots were hands-on from start to finish. This shift gives astronauts a radically different experience, one that feels both futuristic and exhilarating. Crew Dragon isn't just another spacecraft, it's a glimpse into the future of human spaceflight. Nevertheless, after all, Butch and Sunni still continuously emphasized that Starliner is a truly wonderful spacecraft and expressed optimism about the future of the spacecraft. If we can figure out a couple of very important primary issues with the thrusters and the helium system, um, Starliner is ready to go. We have to do some tests, we have to do some integrated tests, we have to bring it all together uh, in, a, in, a, in a process of qualification that is not going to be happen overnight. This spring and summer, NASA and Boeing will conduct a series of propulsion system tests and in-depth analyses as engineers work to resolve Starliner's ongoing issues. Once these challenges are addressed, NASA aims to move forward with certification and schedule the spacecraft's first operational mission. However, the agency does not anticipate that Starliner will be ready until late this year or early next year. Mission planners intend for the next Starliner flight to serve as a post-certification mission capable of carrying a crew. However, it remains uncertain whether astronauts will be on board or if the mission will be limited to cargo. On the other hand, in a worst-case scenario, if Boeing fails to resolve the propulsion system issues, NASA may be forced to conduct yet another uncrewed test flight, Starliner's fourth. The astronauts' confidence is reassuring, but does it tell the whole story? Let's be real. The Starliner program has been a 10-year saga of major technical failures. And despite all the reassurances, NASA and Boeing still haven't fully fixed the core issue, the propulsion system failure. There is skepticism about the design and manufacturing process, with some suggesting that the problems are systemic and could lead to more severe consequences if not properly addressed. So why should we believe that this time is any different? NASA has been publicly standing by Starliner, but given their history of go-fever decision-making, does their confidence still hold the weight with us? Or is this just another high-stakes gamble with human lives? Before Starliner's crew flight test, astronaut Butch Wilmore openly voiced his biggest concern, the thrusters and valves. Previous OFT, orbital flight test, missions already had failures. But here's the real problem. Engineers never get the hardware back. Starliner's service module is jettisoned before the capsule returns. So they're left with nothing but data and engineering judgment to diagnose issues. Wilmore put it bluntly in an exclusive interview with Ars Technical recently. 
If we lost thrusters, we could be in a situation where we're in space and can't control it. That's what I was thinking. And oh my, what happened? We lost the first thruster. And that's exactly what happened during Starliner's approach to the ISS. Except it didn't stop at one failure. As they neared the ISS, five thrusters failed one after another. Helium leaks continued. And suddenly, Wilmore and Sunita Williams were no longer fully in control. At that moment, they had to make an impossible choice. Attempt to dock manually despite major failures. Abort and return to Earth with a spacecraft they couldn't fully control. Thankfully, mission control pulled through, keeping communication open and sending commands to assist the astronauts. In the end, the spacecraft managed to dock, but let's not pretend this was a successful mission. So far, I also am unbelieving that the Boeing spacecraft was clearly not 100% ready for human flight, so why push forward? Beyond that, why didn't the astronauts reveal these serious failures until after they were safely back on Earth and after the election? Coincidence? Or is there more to the story? And most importantly, why would they agree to fly on that death trap again? Is it because they genuinely trust the spacecraft and believe NASA and Boeing will fix the issues? Is it because they've developed some kind of loyalty or attachment to Starliner despite its failures? Or, let's be real, is it simply because NASA has no alternative options right now? Maybe I'm reading too much into this. But what's your take? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I want to hear what you think. Anyway, let's take a moment to send a massive thank you to the incredible team at NASA's Mission Control in Houston. Their quick thinking and split-second decision-making were the difference between a tense situation and a potential disaster. Without them, things could have gone very differently. And while we're handing out thanks, don't forget to give a special nod to Boeing for their oh-so-humane decision, letting NASA handle mission control for Starliner. I mean, why take on the stress themselves when they can just outsource the nail-biting to someone else? Classic teamwork, right? Clearly, Boeing is completely incapable at such points. In contrast to SpaceX, which runs their Crew Dragon flights directly from their own headquarters in Hawthorne, California. No outsourcing. No handing off responsibility. Nearly five months after an uncrewed Starliner undocked from the International Space Station, Boeing announced that it lost an additional half a billion dollars from its troubled spacecraft, as the fate of its contract with NASA remains unclear. Boeing reported a total of $523 million in losses from the Starliner Commercial Crew Program in 2024. That brings the total amount of losses from the ill-fated program to a whopping $2 billion in cost overruns. Boeing cited highly complex designs and technical challenges, as well as scheduled delays and cost impacts, that increased the cost estimates for its programs.